Welcome back to the BIM Hero podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking about uh, GIS, we'll be talking about underground utilities, and the science of where. Welcome, gentlemen. Just wanted to start out by uh, introducing yourselves. Go ahead, Jim. All right. So my name's Jonathan Ng. I'm the Glo Global Sales Director for Hexagon. And basically, I cover the whole coverage of all our different buildings and infrastructure products. And I'm Chris Jackson from Esri. I'm part of the Global Business Development Team, uh, based out of London, but looking at all of our distribution companies in, in Europe. So one of the things that I wanted to start off with that I think is really fascinating about what you two do is, I think for a long period of time in this industry, we always concentrated on the actual coordination of the building. But we had no idea, I guess, in terms of trying to get involved with the actual environment that it was going to be built in. How, what was the, uh, how did the concept of both of your companies come about in, in that, um, trying to fill that need? Shall I, I yeah. I'm happy to start that I'm the, um, I'm the son of an architect. And so I spent a long time when I was a kid next to him with his drawing board, sheet of paper, drawing buildings, imagining places, but we never put a map underneath it. You know, it was zero, zero. And so the, the idea of using context right at the outset, it's sort of been there, you know, the, the concept of landscape design and urban design is not new at all. But the idea of having an accurate starting point, you know, proper latitude, longitude, or an, an actual location to start your drawing from um, hasn't really taken off until, you know, recent times. Our business has been primarily in the government space, supporting landowners, um, agricultural practices, anything that's happening in the natural environment, forestry. That's a, a Esri, Esri's uh, an acronym, actually, for the Environmental Systems Research Institute. And our uh, the earliest work that was conducted late in the 1960s was about mapping agricultural land and floodplains and answering get you know asking questions about what if and how you know trying to understand the relationship of information to to maps so we have a, a strong history of working in in those industries met in in the government space and and then latterly we we've, we've discovered this sort of new requirement to to integrate and and there's a convergence going on between gis technology and, and bim technology so we're really excited about it because the, there's so much opportunity and, and we we sort of paraphrase it as designing with context mm -hmm. because the gis the strength of a gis the thing the strength of thinking geographically is that you are taking account of the natural environment and the societal environment you know the way that humans move around both the urban and the natural environments so it's too easy to say, well, why would you not do that as an architect or an urban planner or um, if you're involved in master planning? It's too easy to say, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you do that? And of course, people have been doing this. Um, but the opportunity now is because the technology integrations are so much easier to accelerate that. And by accelerating that, our goal is to accelerate the design process, the speed to insight. Um, helping people to create more sustainable designs, helping to improve collaboration between all of the various stakeholders because, you know, architects, engineers, construction professionals, owners, everyone knows how to use a map, right? right? <laughs> this, is the, this is what we come back to is the glue that sort of underpins everything in, right. in that context. Yeah, so. and take that map of what they've known and put that in a common environment that they understand with buildings. Yeah. And now trying to make the connections. With exactly the right. Yeah. And the cause and effect, you know, so what happens if we change the angle of the building? You know, how, do, how does the natural sunlight affect its CO2 properties? Correct. Right. So how do we help with carbon counting of material choice by adjusting the, the building orientation because of the azimuth of the sun in spring? Right. Or, or the, the type of the tree canopy that might be close by because of the species of tree and all of these interconnections that we experience in our own lives, but that haven't been that easy to do in, in technological terms. 
And then from the perspective of the hexagon, what are you trying to do on your front software base and, and yeah. hardware base? Yeah. So I think hexagon has a similar history where we wanted all these mapping and we have all these various technologies for scanning to map. And even we have planes that do all these mapping across the world. But ultimately at hexagon, we see that data is the new oil, right? This is where content is actually very important. And that's where our geospatial content systems, right? We are providing these data to everybody, whether it's companies that needs logistics planning, that they need to know what's the environment, where they are working in, and then they can construct effectively. So I, I think from Hexagon's point of view, our content business is going to be the future. It's going to move into data rather than actually physical equipments and things like that. And on that front, do you see that the data that you're uh, extracting, wh whether it's on the surface or if it's under the surface, does the advantages seem vast? And then on that note from both of you, how can we improve data collection of under the ground? I think that's the next big push of this. We can see it, but what can we not see? Correct. And that's that's the limitations, right, of the current technology. Whether it's the Amazon forest that we are trying to map right now, you've got different levels of canopy. We can't see really what's on the ground itself. And that's where we really need to improve some of our scanning and mapping technologies so that we can do this. And these are exercises that we are doing, that we are mapping uh, the Caribbean, right, for seagrass, because mm -hmm. we want to test how can we improve our technologies to really look through these canopies and get to the bottom of the sea, literally. Uh, what do you think on that? Well, I completely agree. And I'd, I'd also say it's the same above ground. Right. You know, increasingly we see... Um, construction projects, as an example, using more and more sensors mm -hmm. to monitor and to track and measure nitrogen dioxide on site, sulfur dioxide, you know, particulate matter. You know, we can we can ingest weather sensor data to track how the concrete offsetting is going to, you know, um, be impacted. Um, there's some amazing work being done by a startup to look at um, CO2 emissions mm -hmm. using the NASA low orbit satellite yep. system so you know the, the incredible thing is is that it's it's never it, it's always exciting yeah. our industry the geospatial it is, and it I is. Hope Jonathan agrees it. it's it's I, I i find myself finding this every saying this every year it's never been more exciting to be involved in the geospatial industry because all the the technology moves along of course it does but it's what we can do with what our customers are doing with it which is really exciting you know and helping them to change the way they think about things, you know, helping us to move from, again, in the construction space, since we're at the BIM Coordinator Summit, helping us to shift minds from the linear, the, the old sort of traditional linear approach to infrastructure development through to thinking about more circular principles, you know. You can't do that unless you take the time to understand the interconnectedness and the complexity of the natural and the built environment and how they interact. I think the other thing that, that really strikes me is that for for a very for, for the last two hundred years we've had a we've had a mindset which is that uh, humanity and, and um, development is in control of nature. Right. You know, so we've just taken what we needed and we throw a third of it away. And yep. We we really haven't cared. Right? right. So my my hope is that through helping people to understand that design in context, we can change that mindset so that we have infrastructure designs that are subservient to nature right or at least recognize that nature is actually you know we're we're, we're we are part of nature we're not above it and you know we've got to recognize that because right. we need to make that change in the way we think about the the land that we have right because you, you have a we've always looked at it as a static building Mm. Uh, and really, it is uh, static buildings in the ecosystem of buildings in the ecosystem of the living world. Mm. And I don't think we have, as a society, or in, especially in the AEC industry, respected that mm. the right way. Mm -hmm. But also in the right, uh, right world of planning that mm. in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're in a dynamic world where all of these things that you guys are focused in on uh, have a huge impact on a project. Mm -hmm. uh, cost wise how long it's going to take to do it yeah and I, I think it's really exciting where that's going yeah just the question i have is what are some of the uh different uh products that you guys have that you feel like are, are just just absolute game changers that are going to change geospatial space 
wow, we've got lots of products. Yeah, I, I can go on my sales page right now. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I think it's like you said, right? I, I, I'm originally from Singapore, where we have this living building in Singapore, where we really mix both nature and any buildings. And I think that's the key is that there needs to be that mindset change from the architects, the owners to really do this. And ultimately, everything that Hexagon produce is supporting this. We are not going to be the ones that are going to change the designs, but how can we support these processes to be more effective? And ultimately, I, I just presented at the connected platform, it is connecting the information. And that's where we have different technologies to connect everything and uh, metaverse, right? That's, that's really where we can bring everything together connect all these data, and then you, you are able to use it in an effective way. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the next step is taking the data that's in your platforms, being able to either um, merge that into an authoring software or, you know, produce a situation where you can export the data and put it in more effectively. So there's two things to me. There's, there's, the, there's the data collection. Correct. Right? So... Esri has a curated set of content under a, under what we call the Living Atlas, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is is global data sets yep. that that we curate. But a huge number of the layers within that Living Atlas are actually provided by our customers. Right, you know. So our role is to help them to be able to collect more data that is meaningful to their work. You know, not just collecting it for collecting its sake but is to be able to help them to collect it more efficiently and and then to be able to get make faster decisions or get faster insight from using the analytical tools to you know um, analyze the data overlay it with other with other content and so on so i would say this so, so you talk about new products i mean these will be common for both of our companies you know the area of reality mapping yes using drones, using low-flying um, aircraft, even satellite imagery, to rapidly collect massive amounts of data, process it really quickly, and then be able to use it for so many different purposes. You know, And the idea there is really to help that decision-making process. It's right. revealing patterns. It's revealing things that you wouldn't otherwise see. So I think in that space, the reality mapping space, there's a huge amount. Well, reality mapping meaning not just the concept of the imagery but the tools that you can that you can now use to capture it and then process it and the other one inevitably you've probably heard this word in here mm -hmm. Corey, many times today yeah, you know, yeah. is ai of course right? oh, i was going to say that one <laughs> oh, sorry. Analy the analytics behind <laughs> all this words it's yeah. like so if if i could ask you know uh, uh, you know it's too easy to go to chat gpt and say Please give me the design for a building that respects environmental stewardship, social equity, and economic resilience, and it needs to house these, you know, this number of people and this residential commercial mix. And by the way, this is where it is. Yeah. Right? Why not? At least have some design options. We're seeing this already. Some architecture firms are, are doing very, very fast iterative design and optioneering, you know, yep. using AI. Yeah. So it's that is definitely coming. Um, and I so, think yeah. the industry as a whole, uh, you know, on the construction side, anything that deals with the the earth, moving of it, uh, moving of dirt, um, you know, having to deal with geotechnical aspects of mm. it is big cost. Right. Um, and, and being able to plan for that is very important. And it's not just economic cost either. Right. I'll give you an example. Balfour BT Vinci, they're mm. a um, joint venture in the UK that are working on the high speed two rail infrastructure project. Right. They're using Mavic drones, yep, and they are doing stockpile volumetrics. Yep. Okay, so they've estimated that across the the piece of work that they're doing, they could be saving up to five million pounds easily. You know, yeah, the dirt's not cheap. Um, <laughs> it's not cheap. It's, you you know, handle it. You, you're handling well, it again. You're moving it. Yeah, yeah. But the thing that I like about that story is that it's it's actually the the, the benefits are not just financial. Mm -hmm. you know, this is always almost like a sustainable proper sustainability story. Because right. Not only is it saving them money and making them economically more viable as a as a delivery agent, but guess what? You know they don't have teams of staff going out with ranging poles, climbing up ten meter high mm -hmm. stockpiles, putting themselves at risk. You know, in weather conditions that are often you know, un unpredictable. Just to see how much dirt is in the pile. To do the same work, right? So they can now scan a stockpile in about 20 minutes, 
create the 3D model, work have out proper the control, and so within how how accurate? Oh, centimeter accuracy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and and be able to determine when do we need the next delivery, right? To fill it back up, mm -hmm. is it being used at the speed we thought that it was? Right. What can we learn about how the project is going by doing this piece of analysis? So. They're helping to improve health and safety on site. They're saving money. Yep. They're by saving, not moving the dirt. By not moving the dirt. Multiple, multiple times. They're, um, they're saving time because they can make decisions faster. Um, and they're lowering their carbon footprint yep. because they've got fewer people involved in the overall process. You know, So it's it's that sort of mindset from construction companies like Alpha BT Vinci um, that are driving us because we see those you know, questions coming and uh, we, 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 our product roadmap is, is very much geared towards customer requirements. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of our DNA is that's always been the way that we've developed products. So when you get innovative companies like that saying, no, we want to do things differently. We think we know we've got some ideas, but we, you know, and then, then we can get to work. Yeah, I think that's something that's really interesting. We talked the other day was about what you, what you guys are doing with a product like AgTech, and you're taking something that is is I've said this multiple times today, but it's not a, a sexy thing, but it has a lot of uh, it's got a lot of costs associated with it, and and you make it uh, easier to understand and break down so that when you go to the reporting of it, you you understand what you're moving in a very quick amount of time. But also, I think that. What gets lost uh, is the ability to take that into the coordination, and 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 not just use the two D data that you're getting from it, but also the three D information. Yeah, I agree. I, I think a lot of our ag tech customers are really doing all these dirt calculations, the volumetric, but it's not used to the fullest extent. Correct. Right. It we can include and pass this to a GPS model, pass it to a machine control, and continue the process mm. and that's where a lot of our customers tend to just stop at the dirt simple parts mm -hmm. we don't and, go all the and way. you don't go all the way yeah. right so it's really about connecting it and in the end it's efficiency right and the carbon footprint and in the end we believe machinery should be autonomous right why can, why can we do it in manufacturing mm -hmm. that basically everything is autonomous there's one operator for a whole factory but look at our job sites. We have hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. so, and they're all put at risk when they're in those types of environments. Exactly right. And you oh. come back to buried assets. We're talking about underground yeah. data. So we're every day on a construction site, there is the risk that a construction worker, if they're involved in digging into the ground, might come across some buried asset that was inaccurately mapped or whatever. So, And you, what if it's like uh, power? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. it could be yeah. a major consequence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, these are these are the interesting bits when we get to, um, the, you know, even still in the traditional construction method, you know, we can start to use AR and VR. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've seen great demonstrations from a company called V-Labs and um, a construction firm, Hyman's, in, in the Netherlands, where they're using similar you know, Oculus Rift headsets to... Yeah. to actually visualize the the buried assets and and make sure that before they go anywhere near anything that they know exactly where everything is you know that's that's you can't do that in many other technologies than geospatial technology you know, that's what's exciting the other piece of this too is and we'll come back to the utilities uh, uh, in, in another part of the conversation but it's also the um, the soils and be able to look at like unsuitable soils versus rock versus i, I feel like that's a a geotechnical piece that is something that a lot of people have not been exposed to, uh, whether the, they didn't go to university to study it or uh, they uh, have not come in contact or or it's it's a complex topic to really dive into and mm -hmm. understand the processes of how the data is collected, and how it comes out. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's a that's a huge part when a project gets started and you do borings on a project and you're trying to understand what that job is trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, the, the logical sense at this point is more boring. You just keep boring, 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 boring. Because the, the, the idea is just like, how do I know from this boring to that boring that it, the earth stayed the same? Mm -hmm. Because the earth is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, where do you feel that aspect of, of the geospatial world is going to go? Because we, we do as much as we can to, uh, to create allowances to try to counteract some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the long run, there's only so much you could do with the data that you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just interested in where you both think where that piece so is going. 
Well, here in the UK, we're really lucky mm -hmm. to start with because we have the British Geological Survey mm -hmm. who've, you know, they're not as old as the geology, but they've been around for a long time, okay? <laughs> um, and and the great thing there is that they've been doing 3D GIS for years yeah. to model the geology of Great Britain, yep. you know? So, so that technology already exists, right? So interestingly for them, a commercial model might be to say, okay, well, all of a sudden there's a new application for our content now because we can be providing this to construction firms to help them to design in context, as we said before. So we have this initial plan for a, a, a new bridge, let's say, or a new roadway. Well, actually, even though we think that that's the right orientation for it, are we checking against all the possible variables here? You know, going back to the sustainable, are we checking against the natural environment and checking against the societal environment? You know, have we actually chosen the best position for this? And then even in it, further down, have we chosen the right position for the, the, the superstructure and the foundations? Exactly. So you're absolutely right. This, this is where that fusion of GIS and BIM is starting to add even more value now yes. than, than just this, the, the, topography, the surface topography. Absolutely. What do you think on that? No, exactly. It's the same thing, right? It, we really need to know what we are working with. Right. And that's the problem. It's really more balls, more tests to find out. And unfortunately, again, there is limited technology of really seeing what's underneath the ground. And do you think that that hardware uh, technology will develop over the next 15 years? Or that, That's the thing. I feel like the software is, is much further advanced and ready to uh, obtain this information from the hardware, mm. but the hardware hasn't caught up in this. Regard. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an imagery or, or mm -hmm. LIDAR or sonar expert at all, but right. something that I found really interesting was that we have um, we have a, a product site scan, which is for doing drone survey, um, both setting out the, the, the flight path, but also then the collection of the data and using machine learning models, we can identify things like cracks on runways, yeah. just as an example on, a, on, on an airport runway. So similar sort of outcomes to the stockpile example, where it's faster to survey, it's safer because you're doing it with a m machine instead of human beings on the, you know, on the runway. And a lot faster. Right? It's, it's faster so you don't have to close down the runway for so long. Exactly. But the, the use of ground penetrating radar. LIDAR yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and radar. Yeah. To be able to measure the depth of the cracks from a, from a distance is then where it gets really interesting yeah. because you can then start to say right well we only need to do the maintenance schedule on these and not everything think of the time that that saves that you know it's, it's astonishing really yeah so i expect to see more more of that you know ground penetrating and how and application deeper and how far we yeah, can go yeah because why I mean, not yeah, you know? exactly I mean, it, but it comes down to a health and safety thing Mm -hmm. There might be a technology that's out there that might be able to take on the challenge, but does it change the characteristics of the earth to try to collect the data? Right. That's, that, that's something we don't want to go down. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, so it's, it's a catch 22 on that. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I get a lot of questions throughout the year about what, what is geospace, uh, spatial data trying to do and where's geo, geotechnical engineering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how we solve, you know, retaining walls and, and different structures and, and try to figure out that yeah uh, it's it's such a, a unsettled science because there's just so much still unknown about yeah the yeah ground. and then you could start to think about things like geothermal energy yeah for, for yeah. heating and lighting and, yeah. and you know heating and cooling of buildings yeah. again in that sustainable mindset of thinking okay well now we have the capability through boring and tunneling but you know in the same way we should be able to develop technology to do that faster and more efficiently and, right um, and more accurately to say, okay, well, now when we're designing this neighborhood, we know that if we were to actually just move it, not only does that perhaps have a lower environment, environmental impact right. because we're further away from the protected species, yep. but actually that, that area is a much better source of geothermal energy. So, you know, again, designing in context, I think, is the thing that excites me around, yeah. around this. Um, you know, going to the utilities again, mm. I think the uh, fascinating thing about utilities you know, versus like the unsuitable soils is that it is typically something that stays consistent. Um, there's times that it doesn't, uh, but for the most part, there is. And I think that as we progress with, you know, coordination of different items, um, it's taking the time up front at the beginning of a project and effectively 
capturing the existing condition, yeah. whether that is in the ground, like we've talked about, or if it's in the air, just doing the land. I feel like that has to become an essential piece of coordination moving forward. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. I think the biggest problem is that every time a contractor gets awarded, they rush to sign. Right. Well, That's the but only if we took a couple extra, uh, just a little bit extra time to do some research about the existing condition. The amount of time and money saved would be astronomical. Exactly. And that's that's the biggest issue, right? Is the minute they get that award, they rush to site, they take over and they start doing. Yeah. And that's where we really need to plan more mm -hmm. before doing, right? And doing that few more days, so it really makes a big difference. And somehow we need to change that mindset. If we don't, all the contractors are still going to do the same way, rush the site, let's start building. Yep. And some of that is driven by the client, right? Because the client wants to take and, and, and get something that they can then turn into a cash flow, right? That's the idea, right? For most structures, unless it's, you know, governmental and it's probably got some use cases to help society, um, you know, hospitals and, and governmental buildings. But I, I think that that's one of the things is that as soon as a client actually, you know, uh, that they're gonna they're gonna start building this project on that property. They should absolutely start the process of reviewing the the, the, the world that it's gonna sit on. Yeah, and they shouldn't wait for that design to continue. And and you're right that it starts with the client. Yeah, you know we we've, we've had a lot of discussions this morning in the planning stage about client requirements driving contractor behavior, mm -hmm. right? Because you know it's sad to say, but it's true that the majority of general contractors are working to you know, low margin, high risk. So they've got to manage cash flow and they've got to make sure that they're delivering, you know, as, as, as efficiently as they can. And, and my, my general observation is that that drives them more towards an economic way of thinking mm -hmm. than, a, than a sustainable way of thinking. So in the, that example, if we're looking at an infrastructure owner who's, who's saying, or a utility owner that's saying, right, well, I need a new piece of infrastructure. And if the owner is thinking sustainably, with respect to environmental stewardship and making sure that the services that they're going to be providing are socially equitable and yes, of course, being economically and you know resilient and so on. But if they're if they're driving that into the requirements, then that will in itself help the GC, the, the general contractors and the engineers and construction professionals to think differently themselves. Mm -hmm. The only other way that it can work is, of course, if you have a company, uh, uh, an AEC, an engineering firm or a construction firm that wants to take that sustainable approach from the outset and actually challenge the requirements that they've been given. Yeah. Right. So it could be that it works from either direction. Um, but we, what, what I think is that we need a lot more of that mindset shift, you know, and it's got to happen fast. Exactly. Yeah. 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 What's your thoughts on that? I think on top of what was said, right. I think it's also the contracting model. Yeah. The owner is passing the risk to the mm. general contractor, mm -hmm. the general contractor to the subs, and everybody is just passing the risk. Yeah. And that's all, that's fundamentally the problem, right? If we work together, yeah. then all this risk is all shared. We, of course, have all mitigation plans, but that's the problem. It's because no one's going to do more testing because it's his problem. Mm -hmm. And it and costs then, money. And it yeah. costs money, so it's his problem. Yeah. And then it just keeps rolling. Yeah. So, and I then think, they look back at you and they're saying, yeah. well, why didn't you tell me to do more testing? Well, we did tell you to do more tests. But you couldn't afford it. But yeah, you said yeah. you didn't want it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. And it's a controversial relationship right yeah. off the bat. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's one of the biggest issues is the contracting model. And if we can change that, if we can really work together, then all these risk transference uh, will be lesser. Mm -hmm. It's not going to disappear, but at least a lot of these things could be actually solved up front. Yeah, right. Yeah. Clive Jordan from Plannerly spoke about this this morning. Yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a very good, I love Clive, he's a great presenter. He'll actually be on here in about two hours. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. you ask him the same question. I will. He speaks very passionately about the ownership yes. of the problem yes. and, you know, the, the, the general mindset of, it. okay, some of it is human nature, you right. know, you, you're paid to do what you're paid to do. And then if you can get it off your plate, then you can get on with the next job. Yep. Right. Yep. So it doesn't, it doesn't encourage that sense of 
ownership or commitment to the entire life cycle. And sometimes yeah. they're still on the last project before they, right. they're, they're, they're yeah. going to at the same yeah. time. And exactly. it's hard enough just to take on one. Right. Yeah. So I agree with you, Jonathan. You, there's, there's, a need, there's, a, there's a need not only for a um, better sense of commitment or a better sense of responsibility, but also a better sense of collaboration. You know, because it's too easy. We, we've seen it before where information's passed from one stakeholder to the next and and then there's confusion and then there's information gets lost and there's rework required and this is costly and so on. And then, you know, you get into the who did, we did, whatever. You know. so, yeah. And just to conclude this session and this, this, this particular episode, I want to finish up with both of you on the topic of where GIS is going, where that is tying in with the cities, and how do we take a project-based approach to geospatial information and make it a smart city or eco an ecosystem-based mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a big one. So where we see it is that everything needs to come together. All the GIS, the BIM, the mesh, all these data needs to come together, and then we can plan better. Right. So again, I, I use Singapore as an example. We are mapping the half of Singapore and trying to capture everything and put all this information so that the planners can really see it and build in context. I think that's what Chris said is really important. And if you don't have that, you have that data gap and you're just building blindly and that needs to change. So from our perspective, all these capturing needs to be done. Everything needs to be collated and connected. And do you both think that uh, there's an option from the architecture side or the design side that they would allow the data to be shared broadly? Because I think you know that's a I, earlier today I, I felt like that was a that was going to be a big challenge because that's some of the uh, architectural um, you know creativity. Mm -hmm. But if we're ever going to get to a point where we're trying to understand how all the buildings and bridges and everything of infrastructure impacts our world it's going to have to be much more collaborative. Yeah, I completely agree. And this is where we get into, again, the real value proposition of GIS generically is that it's that common framework. You know, it enables us not only to just integrate different data sets, but I'm going to say the other word, it's the digital twin world. You know, we can... It's come up a lot we can, I'm sure, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> AI and digital there twin are go. the top yeah, two. It's the buzzword, <laughs> bingo. Um, what, what, the, what that location framework gives you is the means to connect digital twins together, right? So are we ever going to get to uh, a, an entirely complete metaverse of the world? Well, you know, maybe one day. Why not? Let's just say That's why not, goal. right? Yeah. Let's say why not? Until then, though, what we can do now, what people are already doing today is connecting together digital twins mm -hmm. to give more of a holistic view yes. of an asset or a piece of infrastructure or a city. So, because we can't get to the point, we, we we can't get to the point where uh, sixty years from now we still have data that's not connected and, and, and like paper that nobody knows if it's right or the has built or all yeah, over the place. Yeah. I mean, and we can handle the ownership part. You know, we can handle the storage part. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we we can make sure that we've got checks and balances in place so that people's IP is protected in that in that way. But unless people are prepared to share their content under the right conditions, of course. You know, then we won't have that more holistic view. We won't understand the interconnectedness and the cause and effect and the consequence of our design or the expansion of our cities. We won't understand that in the depth that's required in order to help us to provide what has to be more resilient uh, urban infrastructure. And do you think that the global... cities kind of dr drive that change? Yeah, they, yeah, have, yeah, to. they, they have, have to. They have to because, listen, urbanization is going up, right? Global population is slowing down, but it's not stopping. Correct. Right? At the same time, we were, I was just chatting before uh, at the Net Zero Lounge, which was great fun, by the way, um, about, you know, there's still desertification going on. There's still flood inundation going on. We, we, we will see more and more urbanization. So the only solution to that when there's increasing population is more urban infrastructure. But if we continue to design it and deliver it in the way that we've done historically, then we are not going to um, be able to have as 
lower impact in terms of climate change as we would like. You know, one and a half degrees. Most scientists are now saying is just a is a is a folly. Now that's gone. So what does that leave us with? So it strikes me that the sooner that we can start to share that content and make better sustainable decisions about material choice, about you know circularity in the built environment. Then the better chance we've got to provide resilient infrastructure for future generations. Jato, final yeah. thought. No, I, I'm quite bullish of where we are, especially mm. with the computing powers, edge computing, quantum computing, AI, it's, all of them. Yeah, I have Analytics. to use AI and digital <laughs> twin. <laughs> But I, I really believe that we have reached that stage that we can do this. It, if you look back 10 years ago, we definitely did not have the computing power to put everything together. Mm. But now, I think we have reached that stage, whether it's NVIDIAs and things like that. Yeah. They are really, we have that powers. We can really put all of this together. Mm. And yeah, I'm quite bullish of having everything together and changing the way that we really build. Yeah, completely agree. And I endorse your, your mentions of Singapore because the, the digital twin of Singapore, you know, and just, well, um, just, it is incredible, isn't it? And and just the mindset around the city planners and the way that they're thinking about the future is, and the thing is, we need, we need to hold up, we need to shout about those examples, you know, that there are, there are others, of course there are. I, it, it, it bothers me slightly though, that we're not, we're not promoting them enough somehow outside of our own echo chamber, right? right yeah. Um, we we need we need for more people and more more industries and to buy into an yeah. industry that impacts everybody. So exactly that, and and have you know have even citizens start to vote, you know, for these sorts of initiatives, so that because they might not be aware that it's possible, as Jonathan yeah. said, because it is happening now. We just need more of it. I want to thank you both uh, for joining us. It's been a great episode. Uh, I think it's a fascinating topic uh, that doesn't get a lot of coverage the way it should. And uh, that, that was my goal for this today. Thank Great. you both. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for having me.